Um, I hope you enjoyed your meal. Good, good. Well, what we're going to do now, and in a few moments, um, Roger and Noel, uh, Roger and Ralph, we're going to have a chat. But before we have a chat, we thought we should all charge our glasses and have a toast to uh, our guest of honour. So can you all fill up your glasses? You stay with Have you all got your glasses charged? So let's uh, toast Ralph. To Ralph. For oh, he's a jolly good fellow. For oh, he's a jolly good fellow. For oh, he's a jolly good fellow. And so say all of us. And so say all of us. And so say all of us. For oh, he's a jolly good fellow. For oh, he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. Then, Ralph. <laughs> all right, if you would all sit down and uh, we'll hand over to Roger now, who is going to have a chat with uh, Ralph. <laughs> well, from my perspective, this is indeed a great pleasure. We have had a little bit of a dry run a few weeks ago, <laughs> Ralph and I. I sat down with him for a couple of hours and we had a good old chat about uh, his life. We're just going to run through that a bit tonight and I hope that uh, you'll enjoy it. You've been seeing a lot of the uh, photographs up there and some of them might mean something when we uh, get through what we talk about. But I'll just start off with saying, uh, Ralph, how come you were born in London? On the 24th of June, 1918. Well, that's because Mum was there. <laughs> and Dad turned up, did he? No, now what, Dad was in New Guinea with Mum and Phyllis, and uh, I suppose it would have been about, uh, well, about 1915, somewhere around there, and a passing, uh, a passing white man shouted across the water through him that Britain was in uh, in the war in uh, in Europe, uh, and uh, Dad immediately packed up his uh, his things and took his wife and daughter and sailed back to England, joined the British Army as a padre and served in France, and then he got uh, compassionately, or is it passionately? If they get in. <laughs> Very passionate. <laughs> and, and my sister was born in, in March, my second sister was born in, born in March uh, uh, 1917 and, and yours truly arrived on in June 1918. And then you went back to New Guinea, or you went over to New Guinea, you hadn't been there at that stage. I hadn't been there, no, I had my first cruise in uh, 19, nine, end of 1919. Oh, sorry, you didn't know much about that one. No, no, well they say I learned the deck, learned to uh, walk on the boat coming out. I'm not sure whether that would be true, but if I did, I, I probably stood up and the boat rocked and you, you rushed to the rails then. <laughs> so do you remember much about the New Guinea uh, experience? Because although you went there when you were only one or two, you were there for a little while. There for six and a half years. Uh, spoke the Kuariwari language, because my only friends were black. He used to swim in the old waterfall. I remember quite a bit about it. I remember the snakes because the snakes used to raid the chook house. And Dad would get up in the middle of the night with his shotgun and clean them up. And then I'd need Mum's help to get to sleep again. But yeah, I, I remember a bit. How, how did Dad get around in well, his missionary role? Well, well Kikori uh, was a, a Delta area. And that's why he built his two boats to get around and visit each of the uh, uh, villages, which were all cannibal villages in those days. And that's, I think, where Mother's nerves began to go because he would disappear to contact another cannibal village and uh, she would wonder if she'd ever see him again. <laughs> she, had, she had three kids with her. I often wonder whether that, well, he became a missionary with cannibals because his name was Butcher. <laughs> 
Oh, no, that's an absolute pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us about why you went back to uh, London in, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and in 1933 something significant happened, didn't it? Yes, uh, Dad was uh, asked to come back to England and speak at the Royal Albert Hall. By this time he, he was fairly well known as a speaker. And also, there was, in England, there was a great deal of interest in New Guinea and also a very strong group uh, helping missionaries. And uh, so Dad went back uh, to uh, speak at the Albert, Albert Hall, took us all back, the whole family, so that was another cruise. And then at the end of uh, the, uh, the Albert Hall talk, he uh, called his children to him and said, I've made a mess of your education already, so I'm putting him in boarding school in England and going back to New Guinea on my own, which he did. And tell us about your family at that stage, your immediate family. Um, uh, I had a, a, a brother, my, Phyllis had died, she died of blackwater fever in New Guinea, uh, age seven. Um, there were no other white people there but mum and dad, so there was nothing they could do for her. We all got malaria and suffered with that in, in, in that area. But, uh, would it, oh, the, the number of the in children... In your family, yeah. Yes, well, there was uh, myself and Hilary and David. David was the youngest. He was uh, six and a half years younger than me. So there, there were four of us originally, but only three at that time. And then, of course, you got involved in the, in the war, and we well, couldn't understand, as Australians, why you were with the bombs. What happened? Well, what, what happened was that uh, I, I finished my education and, and tertiary studies in London just as the war started, 1939. and. Uh, I went to Australia House and volunteered for service in the Australian Army and I was told that uh, if you want to join the Australian Army you've got to go back to Australia. You can't join here. So you've got to get money in a boat and off you go. My brother found the same thing years later when he joined up. Uh, the German Army by that time was getting fairly close to the Channel Coast and the belief was that we would be in England would be invaded and so I thought the best thing I could do was join the British Army. And you spent about seven years there? Six and a half years Six at the British Army. Years, yeah. And where, where did that take you during the world, uh, in the First World War years? Second. Well, the first year... Second, second World War, sorry. Second, second World War. Yes, I did have five months in the First World War. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't vote your Oh, you have not missed the there. It's amazing, isn't it? He's, he's, he, he just picks up so many things. It's amazing. Anyway, tell us a little bit about your, your service and... Uh... Yes, well, I had the first year, of course, the, the first thing you do is you go to a training to, a department for a, a division for, um, for about six months. And then I was sent up to uh, the Military College of Science because I'd worked as a major subject applied optics. And uh, they, they promoted me with three stripes and a crown as an armoured artificer staff sergeant and told me I would keep it if I passed the course, but if I failed it, uh, they would strip it off me. So, so it's, it's one way of giving you great encouragement when you go. <laughs> you are scared to death of failure. And the course required a theory, which, which I did top, I say I was sort of top the course, in theory, but I failed in the, te in the practical side of soldering and filing and all this kind of thing. And so I was terrified I'd lose my stripes. But he said an amazing thing to me, you failed, but I think you're officer material. <laughs> <laughs> what, what rank did you get to him? <laughs> well, it saved my skin because I kept my stripes. <laughs> You want to know where I went with the... the yeah, next? where you went to in... Uh... Well, well, then, and then I, 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 I was sent to uh, Egypt and I was uh, uh, sent to the uh, Casual Barracks on the Nile to do an officer's training course. And all the people there 
there were some people who had been in action in Egypt and Libya, and uh, I got my I got my first bit and uh, went up into Libya to join a new unit. And uh, you want to go on with the war? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, the retreat to Al Alamein and then posted to a unit that was uh, getting ready for the invasion of Sicily, which by the way was the largest amphibious la landing in the, the world had known at that time. Uh, there were two armies, the American army and the and the seventh, seventh Army and the Australian Eighth Army, which had just cleaned the Germans out of uh, Africa, and uh, well, there were over two thousand ships, including about six of Britain's battleships. So it was a very big, very big deal. And I was promoted to captain as as as, as Syracuse, and uh, which is the port in Sicily where we were going to make our supply centre, and. Uh, then, then from there we went up the east coast of Sicily and across Messina Straits. The Americans didn't follow us into Egypt there, they landed up the coast later. Uh, and uh, spent about 14, 14 uh, months in uh, Italy. Italy surrendered very quickly and it was a, a bit of a joke amongst us because he then declared war in Germany. <laughs> we weren't sure that was helpful. Well, we or not. took your time. <laughs> <laughs> and and any, is there something or some things very special, you know, that, that happened during your service in that uh, time? How long have I got? <laughs> I knew you'd say that because when we chatted about it, it went on for a fair time. Well, it did. Yes, well, I, I think probably one of the unusual things which I remember. Having said I was in Italy, we then were moved down to Barri, 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 uh, on the Aegean coast and we then uh, invite, uh, liberated Greece. So we sailed around to Piraeus and went ashore there and liberated Greece. And uh, sat back to wait for victory in Europe day. Uh, and to our amazement we started finding dead bodies in the streets. And, uh, the uh, authorities said we must treat this as a Greek uh, internal matter and not interfere. But we've, we've soon found that uh, the number of bodies was ex expanding and it, it, was, it was ELAS, uh, a Greek communist partisan group that had fought with us, was now intent on taking Greece into the Russian sphere. And so we had a rather unpleasant war against uh, civilian clad people and uh, that kind of thing. And I notice that you're getting a little agitated so I'm no, talking no. too long. <laughs> no, they are very, very interesting little pieces and particularly the Greeks. Yes, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a, a very different thing fighting civilian clad guerrillas to an army. You, you don't know who's friend, who's foe. Oh. So you get sticks of dynamite and you get, uh, um, I'm not holding this right, I think. I'm sorry about that. There you are. There you are. Yes, and so, and so it's, a, it's, it's something that uh, you do remember, because it's not a normal war. You're just moving on a little bit. When you came back to, well I say back to Australia, but you came to Australia uh, in 1947, just uh, shortly after the war, and you had 23 years with the big Australian, BHP. Uh, how did that come about and uh, what was your role there? Well, I, I wanted to get into human resources yeah. and to my amazement, no company seemed to have yeah. uh, a human resources department at that time. So BHP offered me a job in, in training. They were very strong in training. And uh, I started at the bottom as Master of Apprentices with 300 apprentices at the Steelworks. <laughs> and uh, we went from there and uh, s slowly developing into uh, the personnel and human resources. Must staff. have been a great experience, 23 years of a big company like that. Yeah, I finished up Executive Officer of Personnel and Training and by that time we'd introduced our own residential management course and we were sending some of our senior people to 
MIT and Harvard and places overseas for management courses and so on. So I got close to a human resources department at the end of my... <laughs> and then you went to another giant firm in CRA Rio Tinto uh, for 12 yes. years. Did you get pinched there or did they approach yeah, yeah, you? Or? Yeah, uh, yes, I, I was chased by what people call headhunters. And uh, this fellow rang me every month. And I would say, and what is the company? And he refused to tell me the company. Oh. But he, no, he said, that's confidential. They, they want you, and, uh, but, but, and they've said we're not to tell you who I am. So after three months, he suggested I write down what I'm getting at PHP, you know, superannuation, income, and any benefits. And uh, within a week, uh, I got a phone call to go to uh, the, one of the hotels in Melbourne, and uh, they offered me the job of personal manager at uh, Rio Tinto, CRA Rio Tinto. I finished my 12 years there, and retirement in the in the industry, mining industry, is pretty young. I was 62. I thought I was I thought I was too young, so I, I did a, a three years of consulting. And the firm that wanted, wanted the help was uh, Liquid Air. And how came you went there? Did they approach you too again? Yeah, time? well, well the, uh, management consultants uh, suggested me, and uh, so I went there and I spent about three years with them. I had an interesting experience there, but it's nothing to do with what you're going to ask me, probably. No, no, no. <laughs> we're always interested in the interesting yeah, experience. Uh, well, a French director came out to Liquid Air because the French name, I think, is Air Liquide. And, uh, I got to know him, I found uh, found that uh, he was uh, a very nice fellow and then I found he was very keen on golf. So I took him to Yarra Yarra to play 18 holes and we had lunch at Yarra Yarra. His name was Pentagon, the brother of the French president. And, and then he gave me a card, visit me any time we're in Paris and I've got back. <laughs> now tell me, uh, just moving on a little bit from there, you had, uh, in your semi-retirement retirement, you had some wonderful tours with your late wife, Chris. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those things that happened? Well, Chris and I both travelled before we married. Chris had, had four years in America, and she had visited New Orleans and Cape Cod and a few places like that. But we, we did set out to travel a lot, and we did a lot in the Pacific. I've got a lovely picture of Chris and I in Tahiti, we did the four islands of Hawaii and then near Fiji and all those places. We saw a lot of America. And PHP gave me a, a trip through America for about a couple of months because they wanted me to find out a, a little bit of human resources work. But uh, so we saw a, quite a bit of America. Uh, we were planning to see the Rockies, but Chris developed. Uh, uh, Breast cancer, and we had to cancel the, uh, eight days before we were scheduled to go, and I never did get back to the Rockies. We saw a lot of England. Being an English girl, we'd go over there and stay with relatives, and that meant we could go over there for a long while. And the, the relatives would drive across the channel, to, and we'd just decide where we'd go. We never booked hotels; we just drove, and if we liked a place, we stopped. Or we got stopped stopped in one pass going over to see or one of, the, one of the mountains, I can't think of at the moment. So we turned around and uh, my driver just threw my friend and the relative just drove through the tunnel to, to uh, Italy and we stayed at Lake Como. You could do those kinds of things. Beautiful Lake Como. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, and the distances are so small for an Australian that it's easy. Just down the road. That's right. And that, that's the way we played Europe. We, we went to a lot of places. And, you know, and wonderful memories for you and Chris. Wonderful memories, yes. Now tell me, we haven't talked about the family, but we've got to give them a bit of a mention, haven't we? My family? Yes. Well, they're very <laughs> difficult lot. But, uh, <laughs> well, one of them has just said absolutely, so she agrees. Uh, I've got two girls, Sue and, uh, Sue and Jen, and uh, uh, we've got four grandchildren, or I've got four grandchildren. Both of them have a, a son and a daughter. And uh, I have one great-granddaughter who's three and a half. And when I blew out my candle at uh, Victoria Golf Club on Sunday, she was quite upset. Her job is to blow out candles. <laughs> 
<laughs> wonderful to have them here tonight with their husbands. And, yeah. uh, yes, I, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and I'd like to just thank you for coming, and we very much thank appreciate you. that. Yeah. Um, just to perhaps finish up, you, you've had a wonderful time at Legacy. What, uh, what has uh, been, A, your highlights there, but C, B, why, why do you spend so much time looking after these legatees and uh, you've done a wonderful job, I might add, and recognised with your OAM. Well, there's, there's a... There, I felt fairly strongly about uh, the widows and the kids. And there's a little story about legacy where, where uh, two uh, diggers uh, are, are uh, mourning their mate in the First World War who'd just been killed. And one says to the other, what's the very best thing we can do for Bert? And the other one replies, look after his missus and his kids. And I felt very much like that. That really struck home. That really struck home, and I, I joined Legacy uh, in 1949. I, I got out, I was demobilised in 1946. And I, I've been with Legacy. I'm still with Legacy. Uh, we started... Four eight widows. <laughs> well, that's what's left. <laughs> there were more. <laughs> well, we, I, I got up to... In the very early days, in 1949, I got up to about 100. But all you could do in those days, straight after the war, was make sure they helped them, help them get all their benefits they're entitled to, and check their homes and get help with things like that if needed. And then leave your telephone number and say, no, ring me if you need further help. You just couldn't have regular visits. But now with 14, it's, it's possible. Only Vic Rose have upset things by taking my right to drive out. <laughs> but you are going for your licence again soon, aren't you? I'm going to have to be assessed. Going to be assessed? You wouldn't like the job, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I might give it to you. <laughs> now, a little later in the year when you go up to the uh, Government House, you'll get all your uh, Order of Australia, and so you'll be able to put another little medal up there, a uh, little piece on your run, uh, yeah, well, along I'm, with Legacy and Probus. I won't be able to fit them in because there's <laughs> Probus, Legacy, I had the RSL. RSL. I, took, I took that out because I wanted the Probus one, yeah. and now I'm going to have another one. Yeah, well, it's got to be on top. The, the Order of Australia is something very special, and I'm sure, you know, when you uh, realise how important it is and what you've done for the community, uh, it's absolutely fantastic, Ralph. Well, and I'm going to ask you now, we finished having a chat, I think, aren't we? Unless you want to have the last word. I just going to say... You want to have the last word, yeah. I'll have the last word. A part, part of legacy, in 1949, uh, uh, a brigadier, John Mayne, called to see me. And uh, he told me that the government was very worried about uh, Indonesia, now over 200 million people and we less than 20, and also worried uh, at the weakness of the regular army in Australia due to demobilisation. And then he said, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build up the CMF so that we've got a pool of partly trained soldiers we can call on. And then he turned to me and he said, will you please form and command 111 infantry workshop? So I did that for six years uh, until I was set down to build. One more, one more question. One more question. I nearly forgot it. Some chat. When, when you were with the specialist, what did the specialist tell you? About my eyes. No. You, oh. you, when you were with the specialist. Vascular. When you were oh, the, the specialist. The, back, the vascular surgeon, I had an aneurysm at the bottom of the aorta, so it was, it, it was a, a bit of a, a, a worry. And, and uh, he, he said the real worry wasn't. wasn't the operation, it was the anaesthetic. But uh, this, the specialist, when he came around and saw me, he said, I'm going to give you a pacemaker because you can't go and get a heartbeat of 35 again, it's not, not good for you. So <laughs> he, uh, he then said, I don't know, Ralph, you, you, you look pretty young to me, but boy, when I saw your vascular system, that's over 100. <laughs> Well, we might finish on that very happy note because he said, when am I coming back again? Well, you asked him and you said, well, when? Uh, uh, he sent me, he sent me a, a, a review.
Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that is uh, the 4th of April 2019, <laughs> a year away, and then the cardiologist did exactly the same thing. So, uh, fellas and ladies, I'm here till April. <laughs> <laughs> now, that finishes the chat. We're now going over with the family to uh, cut the cake, and that's when we'll have the opportunity, girls, of singing Happy Birthday. Birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Ralph, happy birthday to you. Blow the candles out and then cut the cake. So Ralph's going to cut the cake. If he goes to the bottom, he'll have to kiss the nearest lady. <laughs> Which is his eldest daughter, Sue. Yes. This way? Yes. That's fine. Hey! Hey! Congratulations. Well done. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. Thank you. You want more photos? Terrific, Ralph. Really do. Yep. Well, you, you want more photos? Yeah. 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 It goes ten times. The mop. It goes right up. So I'll fill the clip on again and you'll be terrible. Right. Okay. Creating a video here, as you probably noticed, Paul is doing that. So I've got, when you see the screen say 10, 20, I just want you all to say 10, 20, 30. <laughs> this is Sorry, ready? Paul. Got my own back for a Sorry, change. Yeah. <laughs> 10, 20, 30, 100! Thank you. Now, well done. Oh you missed it, didn't you? I have to say, I thought that was absolutely inspirational. And, uh, sorry? <laughs> Ralph, you're an absolute inspiration and it's a pleasure and it's a privilege to be here with you tonight, it really is. And I think I'm saying that for everybody. I mean, having met Ralph, it's, uh, you know, it's so touched by your life and it's just you've made our lives so much better. Thank you for being such a wonderful person. So I think we'll all agree with that. Thank <laughs> you. 